Praise God. So I just got to correct a little stuff. I knew this last week when I said it, I kind of felt it in my heart, or I did feel it in my heart that I said the wrong thing. It was uh, the 80 silent or 70 silent years? I don't know if I said 70 or 80. But it's actually 400. Yeah. And um, the 400 silent years, from Malachi to Matthew, there's um, 400 years that God never spoke to no prophets or to anyone, it was just silence. Like there was nothing. And um, and then Jesus came, then John the Baptist, actually, was first before Jesus. And God started speaking to men again after them 400 years. And, he, and the last thing he said to Malachi before that 400 years, well, one of the last things was he was going to restore the hearts of the children back to the fathers. And then Jesus came along when he started speaking to the church again. And now he can restore, through Jesus, he restores the hearts of the children back to the fathers. And God being the father, praise God. So last week was about a relationship. Every now and then that light's just shocking. It's about a, a, a relationship that God was behind the, uh, <coughs> behind the, the veil. And he could only have a um, certain kind of relationship with the high priest and the priest. He never went out and the people never come in. So Jesus died on the cross, broke the middle wall of separation. The veil was ripped top to bottom and God came out. And just so, Sorry, I was just thinking about something else that I've got later on or I might share it now that I'm <coughs> thinking about it. That God came out and uh, like it was only what made me think there was only a few people that could go in 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 only a few people that could go behind the veil and what the other thing that I've got that I would be sharing later on but I just want to share it now that I'm thinking about it is if you have a look at from Adam you have just follow you follow the bloodline of Christ so it's his blood being followed through and followed through the family and whatever his bloodline followed through until it got to Christ and his bloodline then came for the whole world. It's for the whole world now, so yeah, so I'll throw that in there, but the main thing I wanted to throw in there was uh, was um, about Malachi, how I shared that wrong uh, 400 years, I said 80 or 70, so I just wanted to fix that up, and anyway, <laughs> last week was about a relationship with God, uh, God became Jesus, the Word became flesh, let his creation abuse him even until death on the cross so that the veil was ripped and God came out and we could enter in. <coughs> God had a plan. It's, a, it's amazing God's plan. He's, he's never in a hurry. God's never in a hurry. With, with Noah, there was 2,000 years to Noah and then from Noah there was another 2,000 years but t 400 of that 2,000 years God didn't even speak to the church so he was patient and then when Jesus went to call Lazarus out he was sick for two days and he waited he waited longer for two days and then he actually went on the fourth day well Jesus came on the fourth day if you want to go a thousand years is about one day to God so four thousand years to Jesus so Jesus came on the fourth day he went to the tomb to call the dead people out on the fourth day it's amazing how God's uh, got patience. He just he just he just has patience, and uh, don't ever ask him for him because you go through a fair bit to get patience. But um, yeah, but he'll give us patience. Uh, God, God could have a relationship with mankind, and most importantly, mankind can now have a relationship with God. So that was the main thing there is that God wanted a relationship with mankind and he came out and he made the way to come out so that he could have that relationship with mankind. And now the most important thing is for man to want to have that uh, relationship with him. And then, and then um, the wedding and, and the wedding feast and at the wedding feast there was someone in there without the garment and I said the garment was the relationship what are you doing in here without a relationship? So the wedding feast is like coming to church every Sunday and whatever, you know, don't go to the meetings and that, that's the wedding feast, but you're in there without a relationship, God. So what are you in here without a relationship? You have to get out and uh, where they'll be grinding your teeth and out in the outer darkness. 
Yeah, so that was more or less last week all summed up in that. And I wanted to go back to <coughs> uh, the wedding feast in Matthew 22 and start at 6. And the rest seized... And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. <coughs> then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and, and as many as you find, invite them to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. So Father, I thank you for your, your um, word this morning, Lord. I pray for revelation of your word, Father. We need revelation of your word, Almighty God. Without revelation, Lord, that's what it is, just the word, Father. But, but with, with revelation, Lord, it becomes alive and living, Father. And we need it to be alive and living, Father. So we need a revelation, Lord, of your word, Almighty God. We praise you and honour you, Father, in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. So I'll read this other one here, John 18. I'll read that too. I've got them both here together. John 18, 1 to 3. When, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the book, Brook Kidron, where there was a, gar a, a garden which he and his dis <coughs> disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then, having Ju then Judas, having received a debt out of troops and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches and weapons. And J Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? So I, did, I, I don't know why I tied them together. It reminds me of why Hezekiah built the tunnel. They came under attack of the enemy. This, this does sound familiar to what I just read, though. So, so you, we know that... Like I, I know the tunnel. I don't know if I've got the tunnel. But that's not the tunnel. That's the Kidron Valley. I did want to put the tunnel up there. I thought, this is the opportunity to share... Hezekiah's tunnel, but I thought, no, I better not. It's got nothing to do with the garden <coughs> or the Kidron Valley. But the Kidron Valley, the tunnel was built, so it, re it reminds me of that, that, that um, he's gone out into the highways and the byways, and he's gone out and he's, he said, just go out there, go out and collect as many people as you can. Go and get them and, and, and bring them into the, invite them in, because why? You know, those that were invited never attended. Those that were already invited, they just didn't come. We've all got an invitation. We need to attend. And that's through our relationship that we build with God. But anyway, I don't know why. Uh, I, I, what was it? Uh, six. And the rest seized his servants and treated them spitefully and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers and burned up the city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. So we know many many have invited, many have chosen. I'm just I'm, I'm just sorry. I'm just sick. <laughs> I'm sick and I'm just confused at the moment. I, but anyway, I know I know I know where I want to get to because it's the time that we're in now. Like, you know, like there was the four hundred silent years be, before before Jesus, and then Jesus came and lived on the earth for 33 years, and then we had about 100 years of the gospel being written till about, till about I don't know, 97 AD or something like that. I think it, Jesus was born in, in uh, 6 BC, and, and, and the last bit of scripture was written in 97 AD or something like that. So there's around about 100 years of God speaking to the church, and the church recording, again, the Bible, speaking in prophets, recording it down and that. But, but now, we're in this place now. God hasn't stopped speaking to the church. We're still at this place when God is speaking to the church more than he has ever in the, in the, in, in the history before. What, what I was going to share was, 
in the Old Testament how I shared, why I shared Jesus' bloodline because that's how it was. It was like family groups. It was like the high priest. It was like the priest. It only come down through one line or the prophet. But now, now it got to Christ. The blood goes out to the whole world, but so does the voice of God. It goes out to the whole world. The whole world, every, the world, everyone can hear from God. Everyone now has the opportunity to come into the presence of God and hear from God. That's the main punch to me message is I've jumped to it straight away. But that's the main punch is that it was in, a, it was in kind of like the tribe. They, they came down through a tribe. It wasn't the whole 12. There was one tribe that was chosen that came down through the line of Abraham, then, a, then Noah, then Abraham, then um, David, and then, then down to Joseph. But the two lines, one went to Joseph who is not Jesus' biological father. But Mary is, so the line came down through Mary. So, so now it's kind of gone from one line that God was only talking to the, the, the priest or his presence was there for the priest or the high priest or he went individually, not every person, but he did go to Obed Edom's house and he did have encounters with Moses. But see, there was only this one line that was there and it wasn't down for the whole world. The whole world couldn't have what we have today. We're part of that. When it got to Jesus, that family line stopped. It stopped there. And then what did it do? It exploded. Because the bloodline got to Jesus. That's that same bloodline that started back at Adel. That same bloodline exploded. And it's here now today. Every one of us have a part of that bloodline. We have a part of that blood and we're here now. It's the same as the voice of God. The voice of God came down singularly through tribes and through, through prophets and things like that. Otherwise, every person would be writing the book. Like every person today is writing the book. Not, not many people have not wrote a book. Not many people haven't wrote a song. Not many people don't pray anymore. Back in these days, not many people done that kind of stuff. But these, this today, everyone's doing it. Everyone's, well, not everyone, because not everyone's saved. But every, and every, even in the church, not everyone has the relationship. But they're still the one that that's at the supper that hasn't got the garment on. But this is what I'm trying to say. It's just exploded. If you want to look at it like that, when it got to Jesus, when it got to Christ, that's where the enemy thought that he had the victory. This is where I've won. He won in the garden. He thought, how easy is this going to be when Christ came along? I'll turn the whole world against him. And he did. Well, the world back in that day. You've got you to gotta, you gotta remember that Ephesus was the centre of the world back then. So the world wasn't very big back in them days. That's where Paul, that's where Paul, it was, it was the... It was the um, the harbour, where the boats come, the world, they go from Ephesus, they go out all over the world. That's why Paul, the first ever Bible college was the school of Tyrannus. Paul put it in Ephesus. It was the centre of the world, so that was the world back in them days. The whole world back in them days were rebelling against Christ. They were against him. There was one or two, but not many. They were with him. <coughs> Even his disciples deserted him in the end. Even those that walk with him. So the whole world back in them days were against him. And that's where that was Satan's job. What's he doing today? But he's got less power today. Because we can all hear from God. That bloodline has gone out to all of us. And that presence come down from God, rip that veil. That presence of God can come out. Now individually God comes to each person. And he has an encounter and speaks to every single one of us. It's amazing. It is. It's unbelievable that God thinks that much, but he always had a plan. He had a plan from the day of the fall of Adam and Eve. He had a plan. He had a plan from the day Noah went into the boat. He had a plan from the day that Jesus was born to a virgin. 
and shame come upon uh, Joseph's life. But God had a plan in the midst of all of that. God had a plan, and that's to explode his voice to where it is today. It's amazing. Did anyone hear from God in worship this morning? Did you, any thoughts or anything like that, that you never thought really of ever before? Or you thought, oh, I better stop doing that. Well, that's how freely we can hear from God. That's how free, it's just God, it's exploded. God's come out in a big way, a great big way. He wants a relationship. And he's going to tell you, you better change this, you better change that, you better do that. Or he might say, my dear child, in whom I am well pleased. But he's there freely now. It's just, wow. <laughs> Can you understand what I'm trying to say? God has just poured it out. And when he walks up and says, You're not, you haven't got the garment on. Why haven't you got the garment? I exploded my voice. I made it bigger than anything you could ever imagine. There's nothing greater in this world than my voice. Why haven't you got the relationship? I came out. You haven't got the garment on. Why? And, oh, mate, he's going to be sad. He's going to be sad. It's like when you watch the fireworks and the fireworks go off and they start off, Boom, 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 boom. But then the end, I always say to Lily, because it goes, boom, 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 boom. I say, the end's coming, Lily, because they always pick up at the end. They just go off at the end. The end's coming now, Lily. It's boom, 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 boom. And that's how God's words come out in this day. That's how God's presence has come out to us in this day. It's just boom, 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 boom. He's everywhere. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. Everywhere. We want to go to the toilet, we can talk to him. We want to go into a cave, we can talk to him. We want to get under the bed, we can talk to him. <coughs> we want to go up on a high mountain, we can talk to him. But not only we can talk to him, he can talk to us. No matter where we go, God will be there to talk to us. What a day we live in. What an amazing day. You know, God could have chosen you to live in 300 BC. He could have chosen you to live in 1500 BC, but he chose you to live today, to be alive today. Me too. What an amazing day to be alive in. There's a reason for it, mate. <coughs> Revelation. If I've got 22 open doors, I can probably have a better bed. Glory be to God. Revelation 19. Verse 8. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and your brethren. This is our Saviour. Don't worship me. I can't even finish this sentence. See that you don't do that. Don't worship me. I am your fellow brother. I'm your fellow brethren. I'm your fellow. I'm, your, I'm with you. We worship God together. This is Jesus, our Saviour. Amazing. See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant. And all your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. <laughs> the testimony of Jesus is prophecy. How do you prophesy? You hear from God. And you forewarn, you give out God's word. See how freely, <coughs> but I don't want to go past that. And to her it was raised. The marriage supper of the Lamb. We are the bride. 
And to her, my, in Zoe 64, 6, my righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. I'm dirty. My life's been dirty. Okay? We owe, oh, mate, this is so... We owe it to Jesus. We should bow down. We should lay down at his feet. And he says, don't do that. Stand up. Get up at my level. Come up to me. I'm your brother. But Jesus, you died and you washed the filth of my life away. My righteousness was nothing but filthy rags. And you've made it arrayed me in fine linen, bright and clean before my Father in heaven. And he's saying, pick yourself up on the ground. Don't now bow down and stoop down to me. I'm just equal with you. What a God. <coughs> That's why they what? They brought the lame man down through the ceilings. They took the tiles off the roof. They lowered him down because he had to come down to Jesus' level. We've got to pick ourselves up to his level. Amen. According to this. Zacchaeus. Come down out of the tree. Come down here to my level. Come down to me. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper. We are blessed. We're called to the marriage. And I don't care if you have a relationship or you don't have a relationship. You have been called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus has washed you. And he's made you arrayed in fine linen, bright and clean, and called you to the marriage supper of the Lamb. <laughs> That's with your relationship. We, we will revert your relationship. Have the relationship. Have the relationship. You need the relationship. Because we know what happened then. Without the relationship out of darkness, gnashing your teeth, dark. And I fell at his feet to worship him. Have we got anything to worship him? We were filthy living people. Our lives were far from God. We didn't even hear from God. In a day that God has made it that plain and that clear, he's exploded it out. We were ignorant to it. We never even paid attention to it. We were ignorant to it. Hey? And we've got every right, I don't know about you, but I've got every right to bow down and worship Jesus at his feet. And he says, don't do that. Don't do that. Stand up here. Stand, come back up here. Come back up here. I'm just a brethren. I'm just a brother like you. I'm just a friend like you. I'm just a servant like you. I'm just like you. And he was too. He was too. I used to think, and I need a big slap, God, you should have slapped me. I used to think... The only thing that makes Jesus different to me is that he had the Spirit of God living in him. And then after about a month, I thought, you got the Spirit of God living in you too. The only thing that makes you different from Jesus is he had no sin and you've got plenty. Hey? He had no sin and I've got plenty. That's the only difference between me and him. That was right back at the beginning of my salvation. I thought, oh, Lord, how stupid could I be? How blind could I be? Of course you live inside of me, God. But he had no sin and I have. Multitudes and multitudes and multitudes. I still haven't stopped over the multitudes that I had back then, that he washed away back then. He's still washing them away today. I still haven't stopped. And he says, don't bow down and worship me. You just get up from me. Get up. Matthew 22, I'll go back to you. How can we not love him? And you know what? I'll be honest with you. I don't think I have a deep enough revelation of him. I, I, I yearn for it. I long for it. I say, God, I need more of him. I, know, I need to see him differently, Father. I, I don't see him as... as I don't, I, 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 I've got this one that I'm saying today and I see him as that, but I don't see him as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the God of Gods and that whatever he says can happen and I've got power to move mountains in his name. I don't see him like that. I need to see him like that. The power we have in his name. We don't see him the way we should see him. We've got to see him more. 
And I'm, I'm, I don't hold it behind it or nothing. I'm the first one to admit it. I don't know Jesus the way I should know him. I've served him for 27 years and the fig tree's still sitting in the same spot in the backyard. It should be over there by now, but it's still in the same spot. In verse 13, Then the king said to the servant, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. You know what? I, I mentioned after 97 AD, God didn't write the Bible again. You know why? Because it's lived. It's lived in us and it's lived in back there. The greatest message is the message without any words. It's our lifestyle. We go and live. Jesus come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Saviour. If I, if, I, if I die the death of Christ, if I'm in his death, I'll get it in a minute. I've got it written down here. But otherwise, I died to sin. I'm inside of his death. I'm inside of his burial. I'm inside of his resurrection. Therefore, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. I am the word of God walking the streets today. I am the word of God everywhere I go. I am the word of God. I said, God, just show me. And he showed me. He showed me that it just came down. One bloodline came down. And along the way, there was only one person. And each, what do they call it? Each, um, not in excess, it's a generation. 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 There was one significant person at each generation that was significant to God until it got to Christ. And then it just exploded. And he to the whole world, everyone. And our job is to live that gospel and to go out and invite people because remember those that were invited didn't turn up. Now go out and invite, but we don't have to speak it. We are the word of God going out. People are seeing our lifestyle. People are seeing who we are and what we are, what we do and what we don't do. And do they believe in the gospel? We can only invite. We can hand the invitation. If you've ever done something, you've given someone an invitation, you can't make their mind up for them to come. We can only invite. We can only invite. It's up to the individual to make the decision whether they're going to come or whether they're not going to come. Or whether they're going to come without the garment on or whether they're going to come in their own little garment. We can't make that choice for people but it's our job to invite. It's our job to go out and invite. It's, this is the scriptures today. This is the word of God today. It's in us going out and inviting people to come to this wedding. Come and meet Jesus. He's, oh, he's awesome. He's amazing. He washed all the filth of my life away. He made me clean and I tried to bow down and worship him. And he pulled me up and said, son, you're not going to worship me. I'm a brother like you. I'm a servant like you. Come and meet this Jesus. He'll change your life. He'll do it. Whatever you ask, he can do in his name. He'll do it for you. Come and meet him. What did I say last week? Not just about preaching the word of God, or did I say it on Wednesday night? It's about the power that follows, the signs and wonders that follow the word of God. The signs and wonders that follow my life as I'm walking around as the word of God and praying for people and healing people and seeing miracles happen here, there and everywhere. The power of God, the signs and wonders following the word of people are getting invited to the wedding, but still. We can't make a decision on that invitation. We can't. Even up until God will tell you they're about as thick as what you were. Hey? We can't twist their arms. We can't force them. That's everyone, individual. You have your own individual choice. I had to make it my own individual choice. It's because if it's Lily's choice about me being here today, where's the relationship? 
I'm going to church every Sunday because Lily wants me to. There's nothing happening between me and God. And when the marriage supper of the lamb comes, Lily will be saying, where's my husband? Where's, where's Matt? Oh, he was only holding on to my skirt, on to my relationship. He never had his own. He never had his own relationship. We've got to get our own relationship with God. We can't rely on anyone else's God. I was in We War in a Bible study just when I was, I don't know, two years saved or something like that. And I was there and, and I had this old red Bible. It was covered in red material stuff the pastor gave me because I didn't have a Bible. And he gave me this Bible and I was there at this Bible study and there was a couple of people there, that, the young fellas, I was only young, I was probably 25, 26, 27, they were probably about 22, something like that, and, uh, and, and they didn't have Bibles and I read this Bible. And God spoke to me that night and he said, he told me, I am the only person I can give to heaven. I can tell people about Jesus, I can bring me kids to church, I can, because I was the father of, five, of, of two kids for five years, Single dad I was for five years. You can you can bring your kids to church every Sunday. You can take them to youth group. You can take them to prayer meetings. You can take them to Bible studies. But you cannot get them into heaven. Everyone has to individually make their own choice. I can show them how to get there. I can send out the invitation. I can invite them in. But it's up to them whether they're going to receive the invitation or not. And I give this Bible. He was there and God had spoken that to me minutes, ten minutes before I made the decision to give this Bible to this place. This pastor had given it to me because I, I didn't have a Bible. And he said, you have this one, this is mine. And, and this was probably two years later, I get it, the same thing happened to me. I could only give him, the Bible was the invitation. I could only give him the invitation. It was up to him whether he was going to open it up or not. <coughs> It was up to him whether he was going to open it up and read it, find out, well, you're never going to find out the date when he's coming back, but find out about the wedding, the marriage supper. The invitation was for him to go somewhere. It was up to him to open the invitation up to find out about what was happening at the wedding. Yeah, so that all tied in and God showed me that and I knew that, but I went home that it's up to him now. It's up to him to open that invitation up and for him to start digging in and reading it and finding out about it. And that's it. I don't even know what I'm at myself, really, so I can't even keep up to myself. I've lost myself today. Oh, hang on, I'll find myself again. <laughs> 37. Go to Google, yes, and put it in. Where, where is it? Acts 2, 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is to you and to, to your children and to all who are far off as many as the Lord has, the Lord, our God, will call. The invitation was to you. Hey? They were cut to the heart. People get up and hear the message, mate, and it cuts them to the heart. And they go out the front and they say, Jesus, oh, I'll be my Lord and save you. Come into my heart and into my life. That's the invitation. It's now the relationship. It's about whether I really want to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. You, you're invited to it. You've got the invitation, but it's up to you whether you go in with the garment or you don't even turn up at all. Because remember these people, they didn't even turn up at all, the ones that were invited. But then they went out onto the highways and byways and collected. So there's still another lot of people that have been invited. But they turned up without the garment. They still turned up without that. This is what this is. And they were cut to the heart. Sharper than any two-edged sword. I think it's Hebrews 4, 12. 
The word of God is sharper. Did you know that you are sharper and cut deeper? Your lifestyle, how we live. Imagine someone that's been watching you and just honouring you and thinking you're a Christian. Oh, mate, they say great, Max, say great, say great, say great. She's good. She's, oh, she's beautiful. Then you hurt them. The word of God, you are the word of God, cut sharper and deeper. The hurt, the wound that we do to them people. Then any two-edged sword. The hurt. But anyway, they were cut to the heart when they heard Peter's message. When they heard his message, they were cut to the heart. Then Peter said to them, Repent. Let every one of you be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit. Every one of you repent. Now see, it's not Jesus. It's gone on to the next layer from Jesus. You disciples, every one of you repent and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, and you will receive, if you receive Jesus, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God's just exploded. He's just sent it out. Now it's, it's up to us now. It's, it's gone through Peter. It's gone through Smith Wigglesworth. I don't know how far to go back. Uh, the fellow that started the Salvation Army, uh, Jesse the Pleaders, Billy Graham, it, it, you know, go, like, Smith Wigglesworth since the beginning of the century, the turn of the century. Then we've got Billy Graham's and them that come along. It's just gone out and exploded. We are them. We're in that age now. We can't look up and say, well, Billy Graham's better than me. I'll never do what he did. But Jesus is telling Billy to get up off the ground. We'll never do what Jesus even if we can do greater than him and all the miracles, we still live with sin in our life. We will never be able to fulfil what Jesus has fulfilled, but he's saying, pick yourself up. Come up to my level. Look at yourself more highly. Look at yourself more important than what you look at yourself. See yourself as someone else, equal with me. You're my brethren. You're my brother. You're my sister. We are servants of the Most High. What a great God. Jesus. Jesus. And then he says, listen, my brother, my sister, if you want to pull that mulberry tree up from over there and tell it to come over here, you don't need much. All you need is faith as big as a mustard seed. You don't need much. Just believe in me. Faith as big as a mustard seed, and it'll happen. It'll happen. Don't worry, it'll happen. Just believe with that little bit of faith. My brother, my sister, my fellow servant, what a great God. Jesus. Acts 15, I read that, didn't I, too? Acts 15, 34. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord, with many others also. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. <laughs> have we gone? Have we just... He was, he was for God but against Jesus. He was against Jesus. He, he was there and he was one of the ones that witnessed to him. And now he's preaching and teaching. In his name, that's exactly what we are. We've got a, we've got a whole lot of the whole lot. We've got a bit of Judas in there because we do betray him sometimes. We've got a bit of Thomas in us at times because we do doubt at times. We've got a bit of Peter in it every now and then because we do deny him. I should have said Peter instead of Judas. Sorry. We do deny him. We got a bit of the whole three. And here was Paul, a persecutor. I tell you what, I run the church here. When my mother got saved when I was 15, I'm mum, what are you doing there? He wants your money. They don't worry about you. They just want you to put money in your little pot every week. 
This is what I used to say to her when she was going to church. I'd be sitting there and smoking me bongs, man. What are you doing going to church? Hey. Oh, I ain't never in the church, dear. I've got a bit of Paul in me. But God saved me. Jesus saved me. And he didn't just save me. He said, come up here and be at my level. Count yourself more highly than what you do. Oh, he's amazing. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. So Silas remained. Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord, with many others also. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren. So they didn't count themselves higher even. Let's go back and visit our brothers and sisters and see how they go with the message that we taught. And we used to go out with the tent. We used to go out one year, we'd do, I don't know, 40 towns in one year or probably more. Just to do 30 something towns in one run. We'd have done 40 something towns a year. So the next year we'd go back out there. You'd go along that year, mate, there'd be 1,000, 1,500 people give their hearts to the Lord. You'd go back the next year, there'd be lucky to be three. Over the whole lot of the 40 towns, they'd lucky to be three still in the church. Three still building their relationship with God. Sometimes none. Sometimes some of them had died while we'd been gone. But can you see, when they went back over what they would have found, let's just go and check and see how they're going. See what's going on with their brothers behind them. Praise God. It wasn't about all about me, Paul, running out. There was, um, I, Jimmy preached down there the other night. Jimmy was saying this church he was in in Africa and the pastor called him there and got him to preach four days, eight meetings, day and night, and uh, taking up a love offering every day, saying, no, we're going to take up this love offering for you. And at the end of the end of the rally, Jimmy's thinking, yeah, this is off, Willie. God, um, I don't know how long it's been on praise, isn't it? God, um, bit of money coming in to support me ministry for six months. And... Uh, and then at the, the last meeting of the night, Billy was sitting, uh, Billy, uh, Jimmy was sitting in the congregation and the pastor called his daughter up and he went back and grabbed Jimmy, his interpreter, and went over to the house, told you to pack your gears and get going. So he was counting his chickens before they hatched, more or less. <laughs> and then he got another letter in the mail inviting him back to the same church as he just threw it up the files and Bit. And then after a while, the Holy Spirit got to him, so he ended up getting it and finding out about it. And um, he ended up going back there. And the, that <coughs> pastor had uh, he'd been done for embezzled and money and that in the church. So one that was senior pastor that the first time, but this new one. And then he took up the offering and he took up two. Each meeting he took up two, and he gave both to him. So if God restored it, the thing about it was. Don't leave your peace behind. Take your peace with you. Wherever you go, make sure you take it. Because it was, it was preached out of, when you leave a city and, and, and they um, and they, uh, they don't, don't um, acknowledge you or don't, don't accept you, <laughs> wipe the dust off your feet and take your peace with you. So you don't leave it there because when you go, you, you go with bitterness and whatever. But if you take your peace, you still remain in your peace. So that was a bit of what Jimmy shared on Tuesday night. Praise God. One moment. Timothy. Second Timothy. So that was a bit about the pastor being a bit gluttonous. I don't know what got me to read that, but I know that's what I was supposed to be talking about. I oh, get carried away. Praise the Lord. Second Timothy 4. Verse 4. And they will return, they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. So that's what it is. Do and fulfill your ministry, do your work as an evangelist. It's not about running out and telling everyone about Jesus. And that's about 
being the word of God being lived out, the Bible being lived out. It's about that. Our lives are living and presenting the Bible to whoever we come across. And then signs and wonders, power and signs and wonders will follow me as I present the Bible to people just in my lifestyle. I don't have to be reading it. Second Corinthians. I'm just, just doing a bit of our ministry now. 5.18 Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. So reconciliation and evangelism go together. God has called us all to fulfill our ministry of even me. People say, oh, you're not a pastor, you're an evangelist. Well, a pastor's supposed to be an evangelist because the whole lot of us have been called to fulfill our ministry as an evangelist. But we still have our prophets, pastors, we have them too. You've been called to fulfill your ministry as an evangelist and reconciliation of people back to God. The ministry of reconciliation. So I said a bit about Malachi at the beginning there, the 400 silent years. Praise God. Galatians. Just flying through them now. Two. <coughs> Nineteen. For I, <coughs> through the Lord, died to the Lord that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lived in me. And if the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for me. So if righteousness comes through the law, I'm still walking around in filthy rags. My righteousness is nothing but all the rags. It's still filthy rags, but Christ died, so my righteousness could be cut. He arrayed the bride. We are the bride of Christ. He arrayed us in fine linen. There's something for him. Something else I had to do. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgression. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. Christ is the word. I have been crucified with Christ. What did he die to? He died to sin. Once and for all. Not just for those people that I've got a relationship with and look after me, but he died for all. For everyone. And if I died Christ as death to sin, and Christ is alive in me, who did I die for? I died for died for my enemies, everyone that speaks against me, everyone that hurts me, everyone that puts me down. I've got to show them what? The word of God. Because it's no longer I that live it, but Christ that lives in me. And if Christ lives in me, he died for them. That they could be set free. But I can give them the invitation. It's up to them whether they turn up or not. But if I don't give them the invitation, they'll never know about the wedding. And that invitation can come in my life. It can come in how I present myself, how I live my life, how I do things, whatever. It's all about my presentation of the gospel. Because he's alive in me. It can't be no longer Matthew Budden walking around doing Matthew Budden stuff if Jesus Christ lives in me. If, if it's me still walking around doing my stuff, where's the relationship with God? There's no relationship with God and I'm still doing what I'm doing because I've got no relationship to find out what Jesus is doing. What's your word doing, God? Speak your word to me, Lord. Speak it to me. I'm blocking the word. I've got no relationship. I haven't heard from the God. I haven't read the Bible. That's his word. There's his word. I haven't read it. I don't know what's going on in it. And I'm still walking around doing my own thing. 
do what I want to do all the time. And at times, I know there is a bit of me all the time showing up. And Jesus, <laughs> he said, pick yourself up. Brother, brother, pick yourself up. Don't bow down to me. Come up here. We're servants together. We'll do this together. We're marching together in this one. See, there's heaps of scripture. Anyone that is heavy laden, come follow me. For I will give you rest. That's another one. If you can't do it on your own, all the stuff that I come to God and had tangled up inside of me, and it was just going to be so, I would not be at the place that I was at today, that I'm at today, if Jesus didn't carry that and give me rest. If he didn't carry my load. I had a lot, mate. I carried a lot. Even just the, just the trauma of the car accident. It's a big bundle that I had to carry. But he carried that load with me. He carried that load with me. And he taught me how to do things. He, he, he said, go on a walk every day. And I used to only walk from here to the elevator and back. That's all I could walk. But he just said, just keep doing it every day. Keep doing it every day. Doing it every day. And I ended up walking about 15 kilometres a day I was walking just to get me balance and everything back in. He was restoring my brain after the car accident. I didn't get all that done to me in, in rehabilitation. That's a thank you for the glory for all that stuff. But God done it. It was between me and him, the relationship that I had with him. I'd go on prayer walks and walk around the town and, and I'd have my shirt off and I'd have it tucked in the back there because we were cool back in the day. We'd eat our shirt down like a tarn and we'd walk around. But I'd be walking around praying for the neighbourhoods and the old ladies at the church would be bringing it up. <laughs> you could tell they were pointing at me and and running me down, you know. But all I was doing, if they knew what I was doing, I was building that relationship with God. Building that relationship with God. If they knew that, if they knew that, they would have just said, oh, I'm here teaching you how to do it. Can we come with you? You know? And God was teaching me along the way. He's teaching you. He's not teaching you the way he taught me. He's teaching you the way you need to be taught. He's teaching Lily the way Lily needs to be taught because she's hard at times. She's hard to... Nah. <laughs> she's hard to get things into. No, nah, I'm going to go. We're all like that. How thick are they got? About as thick as what you were. You know? I was... I was you know, another thing I used to work with... with, um, with um, pigs and I've worked with sheep. I used to work at a piggery. I run, run a piggery when I was 17 for a long time. And then uh, I got... I stabbed a knife into my ear, separating beef burgers, and, and you can't go to a piggery. And I had too much time off, so this this worm wouldn't get infected. So I ended up quitting. I said, "No, nah, I can't. I can't go to work like this." No, it took me four months to get the smell out of my skin. Not pigs, not pigs or pigs manure. Mm -hmm. Anyway, anyway, I, I, I um, I was, oh, what was I just talking about? <laughs> oh yeah, and I worked with pigs and I worked with sheep. And pigs were the most stubborn animal that I ever worked with, mate. You're trying to run them up the race to get them, get them loaded onto the truck to get them to, get them to market. Mate, if they didn't want to move, they wouldn't move. You'd be there kicking them, pushing them. You couldn't. You'd get the electric prodder, hit them, they'd go two feet and stop. If they didn't want to get on that truck, they wouldn't get on the truck. So they were the stubbornest animals that I'd ever worked with. And I knew this. And sheep with the most docile sheep. If one sheep runs that way, the whole mob will go that way. If one sheep lays down, the whole lot of them will sit down on the ground. I used to think, they're the most docile those animals I ever worked with. You know, God, this was years before I got saved, because I got saved when I was 25. When I was about 26, God said to me, you know what? <laughs> if I was going to cross you between any animals, I'd cross you between a pig and a sheep. <laughs> oh, man, thanks, Lord. And I had to think about it. I thought, they're the most stubbornest animals I've ever worked with and the most docile animals I've ever worked with. Well, God said, that's you. That's you. That's me. And God had to work in my life and do stuff in my life and change things around because I was stupid. I was stubborn. I was docile. I've done things I'm just ignorantly, just stupidity way you do things. God said, hey, I'll turn you into the lamb. I'll turn you into the lamb. 
He'll turn everyone. There'll be no crossbred pig and sheep. They'll be just the Lamb of God. And he's begin that process 25 years, 7 years ago. He's began that process of convert me in to the Lamb. The Lamb of God. Amen. I'm putting the time out. I've still got two scriptures here. Look, Romans, I'll just quickly read them. I won't say nothing. Romans 6, 9, 11. Like, uh, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lived, he lived to God. Likewise, you also. Likewise, you also. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed. Not just dead, dead indeed to sin. You also, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. But alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's riches at Christ's expense. But alive to God, we were dead in our trespasses. But the richness of Jesus... He made us alive to God. We were dead in our sins. We reckoned ourselves now to be indeed dead to sin. But alive to God. Jesus, I'm just going to worship you. Pick yourself up. Not son, brother, sister. Come up here. You're just a fellow servant with me. Stand at my level. And then, oh Jesus, I'm just going to worship you. And we, well, if I'm not allowed to sit lay down and worship you, when I come in here on Sundays or Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday, can I just stand there and worship you, Jesus? Can I stand at your level and worship you? You are the king. I'm alive to God. I was dead in my trespasses, but alive to God through Christ Jesus. He's amazing, eh? Awesome. The Hebrew is not great. See what I mean? I don't know him enough. I want to, I, oh Lord, I, I pray and I shut my eyes every night. And I look for God. I want to see you, God. I look for Jesus. I want to see you, Jesus. I want more of a relationship with Jesus, God. Every night, that's how I go to sleep. I don't know how long it takes me. Doesn't take me long, does it, Will? <laughs> it don't take me long to fall asleep these days. I've got a lot of peace. But I just look for him. I want to see him. I want to know you more, Jesus. I want more of you, the beautiness of him. Hebrews 9. Verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, so he washed me. A rain in. No, I can't go. I can't do too long. I want to get to the end. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience? He washed the outside of me. He made me clean. And the shame and the guilt and the, and, what do they call it? I said it last week. Anxieties and the depressions and all of that stuff in the conscience. He once sprinkled that and washed it away. He sprinkled it. He made me healthy on the outside and he's made me healthy on the inside. Amazing. God's riches and Christ's expense. Why don't you bow down now? Why don't you take this spot here? Why don't you give it here? Not you, know, you can't give it. But why don't you humble yourself today? Why don't you humble yourself? Bow down and worship him then. Amazing, hey? Amazing. He's a great, 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 great saviour. Redeemer. He's our God, our King, our Lord. He's our everything. Look at this fellow. I made this. I was in the crowd. I reckon I would have come straight through and kicked his mate. 
<laughs> I used to say that to God all the time. How could they stand there and watch it, guys? When I first got saved, how could they stand there and watch it? I wouldn't do that today, but back then when I first got saved, I was furious thinking, how could they stand there and watch it, God? I knew that, eh? 